Rich family, welcome to another episode of Underground Railroad Productions. This is your host, Brother Rich. As you can see, I'm with Red Pill, and we got a special sister with us. Just met her today, and we're going to put her on the camera. Yes, indeed. We felt the sister's yes, energy. Indeed. Let the sister uh, tell the people her name. Red, you're going to have to because she got signed. Uh, by the way, I'm collaborating with Sarnetta. We out on 125th. Make sure when you're in Harlem, you support the brother Sarnetta. As you can see, the brother got his Patreon at the top. Myself, Sarnetta, everybody got a Patreon. There's an attack on independent media. Um, if you love us like you say you do, make sure you support the creators, KTL Media, Red Pill, everybody else. And on that note, let's start the show. Uh, introduce, introduce yourself, yourself, sister, to the people. Hi, everyone. My name is Ayana. Peace, love, and light. Peace, love, and light. Where you from, Ayana? Because we just ran into you just now. I'm from USA. Blech. <laughs> Blech. All right. So check this out, y'all. So. As Red know, Red, Red is a regular on the channel. I try my best to use trending topics to speak on something that is, is of greater importance. Yes. Since that's where the eyes are, you have to be strategic. You can't let your ego get the best of you and say, I'm going to talk about what I want to talk about. You have to use what the people's into and make it the best of the situation. Indeed. We got a brother called Laval Ball. Ball. Got more media publicity than... The only other person in the world getting more publicity than him right now is Donald Trump. <laughs> His son is not an NBA star. For some reason, they calling him a marketing genius. He knows how to get on the TV. He got a shoe. He turned down Nike, Adidas, Reebok because they wouldn't agree to his terms. Mm -hmm. He's uh, selling sneakers for five hundred dollars. The sign pier is a thousand dollars. Five hundred. The sign pier is a thousand dollars. I didn't even know. He got that. a pair of sandals for two hundred. Yes. He's a he's a he's one of the polarizing figures where you hate him or you love him. Facts. Arrogant like Muhammad Ali, talk shit like P Diddy. I mean the brother he he's something to watch when you hear him talk. Yeah, yeah. What I want to talk about with you and this sister Ayana today is, as far as being a father, because we know fatherhood is one of the biggest problems in our community. Is he somebody we could use as an example of fatherhood? You see how hard he go for his sons. The media don't like that. The media is telling him he's not allowing his sons to speak. His sons are scared of him. He's dictating to his sons what they got to do. He's not trying to hear none of that. He got a script. He's following it. His son is going to be number one or number two in the draft. Mm -hmm. They're extremely successful. He's a married man, although he's married to a white woman. Mm -hmm. Still married. Has a family structure. Something a lot of people can't say nowadays. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about this brother, Laval Ball. And do you think he's a good example of fatherhood within the black community? Do you want to start? Yeah, put the, yeah, give it Shall I start? Let me set it off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First and foremost, he is a shining example of black fatherhood. Why do I say that? I say that because our people are not familiar or they are not used to seeing a strong father-like figure in support of his children's legacy. Now, what he is doing is what so many fathers have done never. Why do I say that? Because the media is responsible for showing us strong examples of what it is that we should be paying attention to for our, uh, you know, just something that we could say, hey, that's a great example. I'm going to use that as a father. We have not seen that before. The media, I feel, have purposely not shown us strong examples of black fathers. Now, we've had strong examples of white fathers. And we've seen it so much that whenever a white father steps up and they want to take uh, the roles of their children's lives, like Donald Trump, he's brought his daughter in to the White House as an advisor, Great and example. she has no political experience. He made the son-in-law, um, they're in, they're all, they're overseas right now, delegating affairs that are uh, government affairs that only somebody who had all con you had to have political, you had to be a political science major. You should have known all of the things that are going on globally. He let his daughter and her husband take that role. And people are like, oh my goodness, this is such a power move. Look at what he's doing 
for his family. The reason why the Saudis and other people overseas who have monarchies appreciate that, because he's moving like a monarch. They do, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what they do. They That's move they as do. a monarch. Right. They let their they they let it they let their children and they let the people who get married to their children assume affairs because that's what happens in a monarchy. But as black people or African Americans, we're not used to seeing legacy passed on from the father to the son. I see Shaq had a problem with Lavar. What are you doing for your son besides feeding him into the system and empower him with a sneaker deal? The sneaker deals don't empower the parents like that. They don't empower the family brand like that. They don't empower the mother. The you, you, you dig what I'm saying? What we're used to seeing is fatherless black boys with mamas. What do they always get their mama? A house? Yeah. I got mama a house. I got a ends. car. That's where but it you ends. sold $500 million in sneakers, my nigga? You have no priorities. You're not building up for the future. So all of these basketball players, you got um who? Uh, Isaiah Ta who Hardaway's son is in the league. Shaq's son is coming to the league. All of these Jordan son is going to the league. But they are not stepping up, becoming the mouthpiece for their son. NAA, NCAA is still robbing black boys, eating off of their backs. They get nothing. Nike. Robbing black boys. The majority of the athletes that are signed to these Nike deals come out of Florida, Texas, and Georgia. All impoverished places where they're feeding the goddamn prison pipeline with the children who don't make it. So think about this. I'm working for the NCAA. Busting my ass. I don't make it to the NBA draft. I wasn't taught how to it's take a, a bit. It's a wrap. How many of these young boys is wind up getting killed, shot, they in jail doing bids and all of these other things because they didn't prepare a future for these young men? You don't get signed to the NBA, there's no balls. I got to pass it to the sister. I'm just right, going right. a little far. Yeah. I need to let you go in a little bit. You know what I'm talking about? So, Brother Rich, what is the... Mm -hmm. What is the specific question, question mm -hmm. you want me to lead in? When you look, when you see as a woman, mm -hmm. as a sister, as a female, as somebody who plays a different position in society from us, not totally different, but somewhat different because we have generations where the black father was missing. So you, 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 you know, y'all carry the baby, push the baby out. And for whatever reason, not blaming anybody in particular, the father goes missing. So you may have a different perspective on the situation. It may be the same, but it's one in which we need to hear. When you see a father like Laval Ball, as aggressive, as arrogant, as showboat, he's showboating, you know, he's doing what he do. What, what, what do you think about when you see a father like that? Is that an example of fatherhood? that we need within the black community, somebody that goes that hard for their children? Black fathers, we need you. And I think, I think one thing that I wanna, I wanna, that I don't wanna submit to is the idea that black fathers are not there, that they don't exist, mm -hmm. um, that they're not involved. I, I read a Pew study recently actually that said that black fathers among any other ethnicity is probably the most involved in the day-to-day -day lives of their children, in picking them up from school, in helping them with their homework, in uh, taking them to different activities. So I think kind of the, the structural violence that exists has us feed into the propaganda that black fathers are not as involved as they are. Mm -hmm. So when we see images of strong, very involved black fathers, I think the systems that we're used to seeing that push against black father involvement mm -hmm. have us believe that when they're very involved, that when they're very assertive, that when they, they assert their power and their guidance and their involvement in their children's lives, we want to criticize it. Mm -hmm. I think we need it, but I think the system a lot of times doesn't create space for fathers to feel in our communities, whether they're with the mother or not, mm -hmm. like they should be as involved as they really are. So I have that kind of father. I had that kind of grandfather. I had those kind of uncles. So, My so you had a father in your life? Okay, Absolutely. Great, great. Okay. I, I've had
had men in my life. I've, I've been grateful for the men in my life that not just my father, but men that lead and guide and that want to be involved and assert um, their strength, their involvement, their, their, yeah, their, their interaction. I think that exists and, and we need them. Matter of fact, my uncle, so just to relate a little bit to LeVar Ball and his kind of family system, my cousin, Jordan Hill, he plays for Wisconsin, number 11. What's up, Jordan? And all right, all right. My <laughs> uncle, his father, went to every game, every game, whether he was playing in California, whether he was playing in Arizona, whether he was playing in New York, mm -hmm. my uncle was there at every game. And there is a whole community of black fathers that understand that these systems, right, that these college systems that prey on black bodies, that prey on black athleticism, that want to kind of use them up, right, and don't care if they finish school or not, right, don't care if they really are able to formulate skill sets to actually create a career or, or livelihood after they're done using them up, they understand that they need it to be present for their boys because there's structural violence that attacks them in all different kinds of ways. We've heard about the stories about these boys having cases of rape, right? Or cases of um, drug involvement or crime on campus. Um, all because the, the system preys on black bodies, right? When they can't use them up the way that they want. So I think that fathers like Mr. Ball exist. I think that we need more of that activity. I think that um, that the way that we relate to them needs to be to encourage them and not discouragement. And I'm all for it. No doubt. No that's doubt. Th that's what's up. Beautiful. What do you think? There's often when 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 they do these double standards and they describe a black woman or a black man. Sometimes they use the word aggressive. But then when the white woman or white man, like Red Pill said, when Donald Trump would do the same thing uh, LeVar Ball might do, they might say assertive. So what type of effect do you think these, these small words, it's just one word, from aggressive to assertive, but it affects the psyche differently, and a lot of times we aren't aware of it. What effect, could, talk to the people about the, the, the effect these words have on our psyche, when, when it goes from aggressive to assertive. Who's going to take it? So again, it's the negative connotations, right? The, the, the memes and the ideas and kind of the psychological language that are constantly associated with certain... Psychological language. Mm-hmm. Okay. With certain... Uh, a physical identity, right? Mm. So if a black man um, calls you out, right? Let's say wherever you are, if they advocate for themselves uh -huh. and they're confident, and they're firm and they're direct, it feels aggressive. Right. Right? People, people language it as aggressive. Mm -hmm. If a, a white man or even a different kind of person of color that is kind of the model minority, right? Let's right. say an Asian person does it or even a light-skinned Latino person does it. They'll be um, languaged as powerful, as um, uh, assertive yeah, yeah. as um, uh, leaders, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's again that psychological language, the, the, the structural violence against black people being powerful within ourselves, right? Because they know that, they know this. By way of the almighty. They know that we are the God image. The Masonic, the they know, Masonic. right. So I think that's a piece of what that's about. You got chiming on that, Red. I don't got nothing to say. I'm, <laughs> she I'm, killed that, I'm right? Well, right? Ayana, Ayana I'm killed up. that. Yo, yo, we, yo, Take, Red, nah. Red, hold up. We got to remind wanna... the people. We just met Ayana 15 minutes ago. Ayana, yes, right? Yes. Because they may think this ago. is a setup. Yeah, this isn't set up. This is a scripted. This, this is. This, this sister. No, this got, is. Got, got. Right yes. She, 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 she's what we needed for a minute. Y'all should bring on Brother Rich for a minute. I've been, I've been, I've been watching him for a hot minute with Sarnetta Red Pill and all like. <laughs> this, though, this, 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 her intellect is up to par. <laughs> and yo, she, she, she got what I need, which I've been missing. Right. She needs yeah, to be a right. part of the conscious community, oh, man. <laughs> so, psychologically, like the sister was just saying, 
you always have to remember in American culture, there's your protagonist and there's your antagonist. Throughout history, black male dominance, that black male dominant energy is the, that's the enemy. That is what has to be suppressed by any means necessary. Case in point, they want you niggas to wear rompers. Why? Why? They want you to wear a romper. Why? What does it do? What does it do to the rest of the population of Americans? Like she said, the European ones and the other racial categories who have been warned against aggressive black male dominance. It's gonna make you niggas look subservient walking through these streets, and it makes male dominance feel comfortable around suppressed black male dominance okay whenever you see a black man walking down the street with a purse you're not gonna feel as threatened as you may feel threatened when you see the brother who be out there working out with his shirt off what's his name pharaoh what no what's the brother who works out the the, the brothers yeah and the other brother diamond right so when you exert herman smalls walking around Flexing, you know what I'm saying? With it, you know. But I'm, I'm gonna tell you, real, real, real quick. I don't mean to cut you off. And this, this has affected all of, like she said, the psychological language. Yes. If I'm in the park, I like to jog, right? And I said this before on an interview with Professor Griff. If I'm in the park and I'm about to go on the jog during the summertime, white woman, they're butt ass naked in the park, tanning, trying to get some sun. Mm -hmm. When you look as a male, when you look at them. You turn right, you know, you just turn right back around and you keep it moving. If a sister's out there, you're like, what the fuck? But why is she that naked? Mm -hmm. Why does she you have pants on? You're like, oh shit, what, what is she doing? Mm -hmm. So I, even I got caught up sometimes in that where a white woman, she's butt ass naked mm -hmm. and I just turn my head and keep it moving. But if I see a sister, for some reason, psychologically, mm -hmm. I got impacted by it. And I said to myself, why does she, why doesn't she have more clothes on? Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to add that in. So. As fathers in the Laval Ball case, right? He had an interaction with a European lady on the news on the K on the news show, right? Christine Leahy, I think. She before he came on the show, publicly to millions of viewers, she blatantly disrespected the man, right? She blatantly disrespected his brand. She blatantly disrespected his role as a father and what he means to his children's legacy. Saying that his aggressiveness or the fact that he won't cooperate with the big companies is going to be a detriment to his children's future, right? Rather than I rather than saying that the role that black fathers was supposed to play in thousands of these other athletes' lives, their absence had a detrimental, you know what I mean? It had a role in them not being as successful or, you know, them not being as intelligent as they should have been when negotiating deals, when negotiating their brand, when negotiating all kind of things that a father should be playing that role to be. He, he should be sitting right there with his child. You dig what I'm saying? Who else is going to sit in front of corporate America and dictate the mandates that it's going to cost inside of a, a you know, and it, for anybody who sat at the desk in corporate America, you know how these people are aggressive. There's no, you can't go in there as passive aggressive. You can't go in there with a Bible saying that, oh, I just want, you know what I'm saying? I want you people to do right for my son and I just want the best for what, what's ever best for him. They're going to be like, well, shit, okay. We're going to give you a dollar on every 100 sneakers sold. And that'll be 100 million. How does that sound? And they'll be like, oh, we'll take it. So everything that the sister said was on point. I don't even think that I needed to even follow up on that. But, you know, the language that they're using in the media, the way that they're beginning, like you, like, like she said, they're implanting keywords. They're implanting uh, uh you know, triggers, tricks, trigger words, yeah, trigger words and things of that nature. Phil, yeah. And of course, black people who have a problem with fathers asserting their aggressive nature in negotiation. Because remember, he's still in the negotiation process because he's still pitching his brand. He wants you to invest in him. He wants you to invest in his sons. And people will be like, oh, he's acting like an a-hole. No. Do you know 
do he he understands that he's inside of a, a certain kind of environment that you have to assert yourself or you'll get walked all over do you have a problem with him pricing either or you know uh with him pricing the sneakers at five hundred dollars shaq said you should do it for the kids he told shaq you need to stay in your lane there's a lane for cheap sneakers there's a lane for expensive sneakers you got versace then you got conway you got h&m you got zara's you got all different types of brands but when it's black people for some reason there should be one or two lanes and there shouldn't be that higher price lane could you comment on that please the price yes. point in my humble opinion is a little too high the price point is a little too high in my humble opinion um the price point of the curry sneakers were eighty dollars i bought my son a pair the price point for um stefan marbury sneakers were very inexpensive primarily because of what you know the kind of deal he was able to broker because he's in china and that's where all of the sneakers are being manufactured. So he said, "Yo, I'm gonna blow up. I'm gonna blow the spot up, and let you know that these same Jordans are being produced in the same factory where my sneakers are being produced, and the and the, and the whole sneakers only cost damn near uh, uh, fifteen to uh, ten dollars." And Marbury supports Lavar Ball, by the way. And Marbury supports he, Lavar Ball. Yeah. So what I would hope the to see in the future is LeVar Ball get up with Marbury. Marbury introduce him to the manufacturers in China so the price point could lower. Remember, he said this is the highest price point for one sneaker, but we also offer different, uh, we also have different price points of different um, designs inside of our brand. You feel me? So he released the high price at first. I mean, marketing wise, I don't, I mean, he's a genius for what he's doing marketing wise. I remember buying a pair of Pradas for 450 back in the day. Some ugly ass Pradas, okay? All right? Yep. When it was Prada. When it was Prada, Prada. You know what I'm saying? So if he feels that his son's brand is so valuable, if you saw his son ball, you know that he's not going to be a regular player. If he feels that he wants to keep the ball at a certain at a certain rate because LeBrons are going for the Jordans and there's 450 that the Indians are selling. The LeBrons are between the 200 and 300 price range. So he figured that he's going to raise it at five to, to signify what his son represents to the league. Hey, that's what he is. That's what he's doing. I'm not really going to tell people how to, you know, how to fluctuate their price point, but I do feel that they're kind of high. Yeah, you know, I don't... <laughs> I'm not really a, a sneaker connoisseur, you know, I have some old school shell tops on right now that aren't over $100. I think when you're selling anything, you think about two things. You think if your brand is strong enough, right, to push the level of product that you're trying to pull. I think the ball brand is strong. I think the quality of material based on the price point, I think the design based on the price point is... Um, I think it's subpar, but I don't think really that that's what they're selling. I don't think they're really selling the sneaker. I think they're selling what it means to have the sneaker. Yeah, and yeah. those that, those that point, buy $500 sneakers should buy those sneakers. Mm -hmm. if, if, if you're a sneaker connoisseur and if you believe in black business and if you believe in kind of regeneration of uh, community wealth, yeah. Facts. Because you could create your own Gucci brand. You could create your own Prada brand. You could create your own Red Bottom brand. He's showing you how to do that. Okay? So he's aware that they got Gucci sneakers for 500 He's like, yo, the same dudes that's in Vegas, running around in L.A., running around all of these places, saying that they big ballers. That's what he said. I'm pitching to the big ballers. He wants them to invest in his brand. He wants them to buy his sneakers. So if that's what he's going to do by building up his brand, you know, I, I don't got a problem with that. For those who can afford those sneakers, they will go ahead and purchase them. We can't start pocket watching as, because all of a sudden, as a people, we started pocket watching. Oh, do you know about our economy? 
Do you know how hard it is for black? You wasn't pocket watching when Gucci dropped every goddamn week. The struggle police. Sneakers? The struggle police. The struggle police got it right they on got target. The struggle like, police. Oh they my got goodness! How Blue, dare Blue you? Bill. Blue Bill gave me that word. <laughs> Don't worry about that. That's he's not selling to you as a consumer or as a consumer slave we always feel that every plate that someone puts in front of us we have to eat it it's not your food it's not, not food. for you uh, it's not for you good point. let that good man point. do what he does if you don't wear a pair of big ballers on your feet don't worry in school, you'll still be that guy. Get some fucking A's on your test. You know what I mean? Let me, let me ask you do, you, do you think Christine Leahy was playing the white girl damsel in distress role on the on um the show Fox Sports 1? Absolutely. Where she said she, he was threatening her because he told her to stay in her Absolutely. lane. Absolutely. Because he heard her talking shit about his son, so he told her. He didn't want to even talk to her. I'm so, white, and right. what I say is right, like the brother Tyreek Tyre Nashi said. Says, right. Absolutely. Okay? Play your position that's it that's what she didn't do okay so the aggression or the, the the she was very passive aggressive with the way that she was coming after his brand trying to drag the brother uh, uh, uh making and, a and lot of children, assumptions and his children and his children so he did what any father should do to protect not just it wasn't it wasn't just him he has to protect his children okay he has to protect. Didn't he go at it with Stephen A. Smith? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if it was friendly. Him and Stephen A. Smith. W was yeah, it friendly they, they or was it, it like? It was friendly, but it was kind of over the top friendly. Over the, it, wasn't, yeah. it wasn't friendly like how Stephen A. is. Okay, okay. You yes. know what I'm saying? He was talking stuff like, hold up. You know, and he, he, he raised up. And LeVar Bell raised up on him, shut him down shut mad him down. time. And, mad time. And, and as we could see in his personality, he watches a lot of TV. Mr. Ball. He mimics the behaviors of, you know, the people who we try to hold up when they're doing it. So he's throwing it back at you. Oh, he's too old to be like that. No, he's mimicking the culture. You Okay, so when people see the culture mimicked by older people, they get uncomfortable with it as if he's supposed to be some grandfather type or he's, he needs to be an, a, a good Negro, a, a good, respectable father. You know what I mean? No, he's going to do what he's going to do. He's selling the brand. People, if, if you know, if people feel that he's damaging the brand, well, go ahead and build your own brand. Let him do what he does. But what that lady was doing, I feel, was definitely doing the damsel in distress. White, you know what I mean? Using a lot of those loaded words. Now she's saying she's receiving death threats and whatnot. I mean, let, come let, on. Let me, uh, uh, Ayana. Let me ask you. It, w when you have a situation, because I want to know a female perspective. When you have a situation where a female's blatantly disrespecting um somebody black man white man whatever whoever she's disrespecting this individual and the individual returns the same marauder disrespect she gave him to her do you think that's inappropriate as a male should a male you know like michelle obama says when they go low we go high should a male go high when a female goes low or should a male keep it low so that females should understand don't go there ever again I think all these things depend on different situations. If, if someone is in tune with their masculine or their feminine core, I mm -hmm. think all of us have masculine and feminine qualities, right? The the core is what balances us out in terms of our identity and how mm -hmm. we express ourselves to the world. Right. And I think a lot of times, again, it's about that structural violence. It's about the messaging that black men should not assert their masculinity because they become an instant threat for people that are living in a supremacist paradigm. Mm. So when a black man is a man, he's instantly a threat. Not because he's threatening, but because he's actualizing his core. He's actualizing his power. And we live in a world that has trained us psychologically not to look at her in their natural power. We should always be subordinate. And if we're not subordinating ourselves, then we're out of, we're out of, we're, we're not on code, right? We're not, so I think that's the piece of it. And I think, I think, mm -hmm. let me just finish with this. I think 
Whenever someone says anything, it's an invitation, right? Mm -hmm. Whenever someone says anything, it's an invitation for response. Yes. And, you know, she asked him a question, and that was an invitation for him to express his, himself in his own masculine response. But she couldn't handle it because she lives in that supremacist paradigm. And I just want to add on, keep in mind the arena that this whole fiasco was taking place in the psychology that has been created in this arena. Here it is, this is the NBA, where black men are being paid millions of dollars to do what? Assert their physical prowess, but not their mental prowess. Mm, okay, not that's their a, mental that's prowess. A good point. That's a good There's point, There's no right? example okay. of, a, of a LeBar ball in, on the court and off the court. The closest that you may find is a Stephen A. Smith, who was paid millions of dollars to do what? Assert his mental prowess, but we see where that goes. When he talked about that white girl, he got suspended. Okay, Early. all right, so. Yeah, he did. Inside of the NBA, you are taught they're surrounded by white men as coaches, and then they're surrounded by another layer of white men as owners. And those niggas on a hardwood floor are paid to dribble the ball and be quiet. They told them you can't be political. Look at what's going on with Kaepernick right now. You cannot be political. You don't have a say in affairs that are going on outside of the goddamn court, nigga. Even Trump talking about Kaepernick. So, you cannot be, you can't be assertive to white women. I remember when, what was my guy, Richard, uh, uh, the guy from the Seahawks, when he based, Sherman, 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 Sherman. when he based on the European the reporter, the reporter. reporter, after the thing with him and Crabtree, he got penalized for that. Like she said, that whole, it was trigger words, he was receiving death threats, they were threatening to boycott. All of these white people who loved him when he was catching the ball wanted to lynch him now. So inside of that, they are, they, are, they are panicking right now inside of the NBA. They are panicking right now inside of organized sport because LeVar Ball is coming through and he's shaking it up. Nike, a Nike executive said he's the worst thing that happened to sports in the last 100 years. That's a big statement. That's a, a century? They said he's the worst thing to happen in sports in a century. A Are Nike you, executive. Do you oh. know what was going on a century ago in sports? Let me see. This 2017, 1917. Where but, was we as black people a century ago? We were the ball. And he was. <laughs> no, literally. I don't want to laugh. No, I don't even want to laugh. But I mean, yeah, yeah. But he. But yet he's the worst thing to happen. So, you know, so, to close out, I, I got I got one last thing to close it out. I don't want you know. I don't want to keep y'all too long. It's just a, a beautiful segment. I'm glad to get uh, a perspective from a female and a male. Um, We're we gonna get your number. We're gonna have you on here more often because you did a magnificent job. Um, the brother Jason Whitlock that came and defended uh, Leahy got donkey today from Charlemagne the God. Facts. He called him um, Stephen from J J Django. What's the name? Yeah, Stephen. That's Stephen from Django. Yeah. yeah. So, what's your opinion about? Brothers, not just brothers, but brothers and sisters who I got a job to do. I got to take care of my family. I work on a corporation, and in order to take care of my family, I got to say or do whatever it takes to appease my white boss or my white coworker to let them know I'm on their side. Because that's what Charlemagne accused Jason Woodlock of doing. He said he has to appease his white coworkers or his white uh, um, bosses or whatever. What would you say to those black people who do that every day for a living, Red Pill and Ayanna? What would you say? I would say... And the excuse is I have to feed my family. Uh, Self-preservation. Self Let's let this shit pass. All right. We always have to keep in mind corporate America's structure is white supremacy structure. They, 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 they do a great job at erasing race. So there's no more race first when it's that corporate structure. A person like Whitlock, he savors the moment to be able to jump out at a motherfucking LeVar Ball to impress the corporate structure in order to get, a motherfuck to get another step on that ladder. You feel me? So 
Anybody who's been in corporate America understands the way that, had, that the rules have been set up. The, the corporate, what do they call it? The corporate culture or, or whatever, corporate America culture, huh? The ladder, corporate ladder? Beyond the ladder in corporate America. It's the culture that they've set up with their bylaws and all of these other things. What's, what's acceptable and what's not. So dude is looking, he's not looking at it. Oh, I got to look out for my brother. No, he's like, yo. I'm going to I'm going to fin for an employee inside of this corporate structure and by doing such I'm going to be rewarded by that by by my superiors and my masters. So to say that I'm going to cut somebody down in order to, you know, because I had to because I got to feed my children, I mean, that's coonery at its finest. You understand? That's an excuse. You ride for what's right, and you ride on what's wrong, regardless of the whatever the whatever the outcome may be. Knowing that you did something correct, you don't go against the grain. You do not go against the grain. And some of the things that he said about LeVar Ball, it was just crazy. Like, he really was reaching, so, yeah. He compared LeBron James to Donald Trump. He did like, what? He, yeah, in, in a previous interview, the dude Jason Whitlock. Yeah. You, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Char Charlemagne played it, the snippets. Yeah. Go, go ahead. I, go ahead. I'm going to let her finish I'm, it I'm, off. Well, I'm well, sorry. Go, 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 go. Yeah. What's missing from these sports channels, like I was saying a minute ago, is an aggressive black voice, right? A male black voice that's unwavering and speaks the truth from a center of truthfulness and justice. Like, you don't see that. So you, you don't assume that that exists. So whenever you're introduced to that inside of these structures, because you know you might see it in hip hop, but you're not gonna find it at ESPN. You're not gonna find it on Fox. You're not gonna find it on CNN. You're gonna find an emasculated, compromised voice. Missing, you know what I mean? They got their tonsils removed. It's missing some kind of base. That's what you're seeing. And whenever they speak or whenever they come and, and, and whenever they assess a situation, it's always from that standpoint. It's not from the standpoint of a man of, 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 a, of a man who's got a pair. That's not what I'm seeing. So yeah. Uh, close it out, sis. Close it out. Yeah, I mean I mean I can't say it more. No, you can. Eloquently. Please spin it. <laughs> it, it. It it if someone suggests that the only way that they can provide for themselves and their family and their community is to compromise the very values, right? Mm -hmm. The very principles that they say that they believe in. That's someone who has been miseducated to oppress themselves, Facts. right? Because if you believe that the only way you can sustain yourself is to oppress yourself, then you have an oppressed mental mentality. You're psychologically oppressed. And if you've been through any of these systems in America, you've, you've been exposed to that. I've been exposed to that. If you've been in the education system, if you've been in the work system, if you've been in any of these, these welfare systems, you've been exposed to that. So it's a miseducation of self-oppression that we ourselves protect. We protect racist systems. We do. You know, we have to protect them to keep them moving. Mm -hmm. If we were to be conscious and to wake up and say, I I'm done, I'm not gonna live this way, I'm not gonna oppress myself, the, the system would, would dismantle. Mm -hmm. But we've been taught to oppress ourselves. And, and, and we've been conditioned, we've been expertly conditioned through everything around us, the media. The, the onslaught of slave movies, you know what I mean? The, 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 the non-stop streaming of the slave narrative. It's not just the movie, it's the narrative. And what does the narrative do? The slave narrative shows up in civil rights. Dudes getting hit with bricks and walking off like, you know what I'm saying? And they give, and then where, where are we now? Later on, and like he received a job and he's doing good now, you know what I mean? Like. The slave narrative has been interwoven in the language of America, whether it be through education, whether it be through entertainment, Just whether it be through religion, whether it be through the cartoons and all of these things. So the slave narrative has now shown itself through corp in the corporate America structure. 
that pyramid structure where and and, and, and and you see it in politics begin to seep through to where people have been normalized by this maniac in the White House, but it's still the slave narrative. You have to respect them because he got money. You need to respect them because Saudi Arabia respects them. There's some stupid stuff going on. You know what I'm saying? You should respect them because he has he has power. No, he's a crook. You understand? And the only power that he has is the power that you give him. So you could use that small example, and like she said, if black or African American, aberrant, whatever you want to call us, if we decided that we did not want to follow the slave narrative anymore, all of this changes. Okay? And everywhere around the world, they're waiting for you to make your mind up. Because you sitting around waiting for China to do something for you. You secretly... They're waiting for everybody, anybody that leaves America and travels will come back and say, well, God damn it, they waiting for us? I didn't know. I, w I wasn't aware. They didn't show us this on everybody National Geographic. Everybody says that. Everybody that leaves they didn't, America yeah, says that. Yeah, they didn't that. tell us this on, you know, they didn't show us this in the movies when they gave us the Blood Diamond movie. No, they're waiting for you to get your shit together. They're waiting for you inside of the matrix, you inside of this system, to topple it with your mind. You don't got to pick nothing up. Pick your balls up, black man. It's gonna start with you. It's gonna start with you. Don't think don't think the woman who has coddled you for hundreds of years, who nursed you and nurtured you, and she's just fending for herself at this point. Okay? She's not gonna be the one that's gonna topple the system. You gotta stand up and say, yo, enough is enough. I'm tired of being on my knees. I'm tired of settling for these crumbs that you brushing off of the table. We built up every, it's being built off out of your mind. It's being built off of your blood, sweat, and tears. Even if you in the streets, they still feeding off of you. You still a goddamn piece of meat, okay? Because you, you know, the, bottom the stock market and getting locked up. And I, I mean, I could go on for days. But what this man is doing by shaking up the sneaker industry, look how they got our people uh, uh, sneaker slaves now. Okay, yeah. something has to happen to break that. Why doesn't nobody ask Nike? You asking LeVar Ball what he gonna do with the money. Why don't you ask Phil Knight, the trillionaire, what the hell have they ever done for the, remember, the majority of the NBA players come out of Georgia, Florida, Louisiana, and Texas, four of the most impoverished black states alive, and four of the most racist states, mind you. Florida, Louisiana, Texas, and Georgia. Google it. What are you doing? I'm talking about racists from the po politics all the way down. What is Nike, Reeboks, and Adidas doing besides a basketball camp? What are they doing? They're getting billions of dollars a weekend. These Negroes are asleep. They, doing, they got teepees building outside of the sneaker stores. They having sleepovers and pajama parties. They having romper parties outside of goddamn uh, Nike town. What are you doing to give back to these neighborhoods where your star athletes come from? Nothing. So why are you going to ask LeVar Ball? Why are you putting all of the weight on his show? How are you going to break the pie up, LeVar, to help us out? He's going to help because he's going to help his sons first. Well, okay? Well, and then well, they do the same thing to you, Sarnetta, anybody who has a voice. You know, it's like the savior complex, it seems like. You know. You're supposed to save the entire race. It always seems that you know, way. It's, that's what it's apparent as. So I would like, if you wanted to add anything. Yeah, well, we're closing and, it out now. All right. But would you yeah. like? Uh, would you like to close it out with anything in particular? Can uh, you leave just, your just, handle? Just your, so, yeah, your before IG she does, just a little bit of inspiration for the people. Phil Knight, the owner of Nike, he's a trillionaire at this point, right? A trillionaire, yeah, or billionaire. Gotta be. Well, he started out the selling Jordan's sneakers. He started out selling sneakers in the trunk of his car. Yeah. So if you're from the hood, you know what that that might be about. So yeah. if he started out selling sneakers in the trunk of his car, he said he failed for 10 years straight. His wife thought he was a failure at his company. Yeah. One little thing, one little day, he got this man named Michael Jordan who could jump. that was going to turn his company around forever for the rest of eternity. Remember, at that time, he Nike was the number one. I think it was Converse or Adidas. It was, um, it was Adidas. It was Adidas, Adidas. right. So, so he was he was a failure for ten years straight. Yeah. He stuck with it, selling out the trunk of his car. Yes. If we do that, selling out, people gonna call us bums. They gonna call us beggars. Yes. They gonna say we street peddlers. They gonna think of every connotation in the book to call us. But this is what this billionaire did to get where he got. 
that's a little bit of inspiration for our people. Give them your uh, your, your Twitter and whatever you, to contact you so the people you know, close it out. Yeah, go and download the Know The Ledge app. Go and download the uh, Know The Ledge app out of the iTunes and the Google Play Store. And, uh, you know, get that on your phone. It's free. Oh. Um, peace, I'll give you my, my IG, Lucille Clifton, L-U-C-I-L-L-E, Clifton, C-L-I-F-T-O-N. No peace. Right. Peace. And I know we signed out, family. Peace. All right. Peace. Peace. Peace, family. This is Brother Rich from UGR, urging all my viewers and subscribers to help support the channel by donating just $1 to the UGR PayPal account. We appreciate the viewership and support, and we understand the power of a dollar. If you benefit in any way, shape, or form, we ask that you donate a dollar, whether it be monthly, bi-monthly, quarterly, or yearly, so that we can build our brand to compete with the NBCs, the MTVs, and the Foxes of the world. I figure since Kanye can ask Mark Zuckerberg for $1 billion, I can ask my subscribers to donate $1 so I can make the best possible content possible. The main objective of this channel is to inspire you to become the greatest version of yourself. So hopefully throughout the years of you watching this program, you have been inspired to become the greatest version of yourself. If you would like to donate, you can go to www.paypal.com and send a donation to richandmerit7 at yahoo.com. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your program.